you admitted that the Roberts Court has been trying in the hubbub of the Affordable Care Act case taxi. You further are quoted as saying, what I love is civil, rational discourse, what I can get each other, and the court became a little screechy this year. I, I mean, if you followed the last few weeks of term, the court started to look unrecognizable. It started to look, you know, in oral argument in the ACA case, um, you know, just Justice Scalia doing kind of sound bites and talking points and kind of cracking jokes about maybe we should just do away with the law that says that, you know, hospitals should take all comers. Just a, a level of discourse that, I mean, I guess I would just put it this way. The fact that we even heard the word broccoli, much less that we heard a <laughs> lot about broccoli, was breathtaking to me. That was a Tea Party talking point. That's not a constitutional doctrinal point. And even if it were, it's so freighted with meaning that the idea that that was coming into the court was really shocking. And frankly, you know, I thought Justice Scalia, again, not to single him out, but I thought his reading his dissent in the Arizona case and the tenor and the tone of that dissent, you know, talking about the good old days when the slave states were able to use immigration. I mean, it was just breathtaking. And going after the president, even though that wasn't in the four corners of, of the briefs. So I guess I just had this sense, and I don't want to just put it on Scalia because I felt other justices were reacting positively and negatively, but it just didn't feel like the court I knew. It felt like we'd all sort of slid into, you know, a Sunday morning talk show. And, and it's dispiriting. I mean, it's, it's dispiriting first and foremost because this isn't how we talk to each other in the law. But it was also just dispiriting because you have this illusion that even when they're acting out, there are boundaries. And this was what, just beyond boundaries. Were you shocked by the uh, Affordable Care decision? I was shocked by the lineup. I think uh, I was one of those people who was on record saying I thought it was going to be 7-2, 6-3 to uphold. I thought, and I think I even said that night on TV, I said, I thought after watching argument that Kennedy and Roberts were kind of in play. It was clear to me no one else was in play. But I thought, you know, they're, they're, they're thinking about it. And so I think I very much bought into the conventional wisdom that if Kennedy jumped, Roberts was going to jump. And that's how Roberts was going to get pulled into the majority. So to see it happen that Kennedy, not even with the majority, but, you know, willing to sign off on this per curiam dissent that is really a strong dissent. Kennedy was never in play, as it turns out. And so to see Roberts kind of jump alone, but also broker what is either a brilliant or insane uh, deal over that and the Medicaid expansion, I mean, that was a huge surprise. I think I had felt, and this, you know, apropos of what we just talked about, I felt for a long time that this wasn't a state's rights court. This wasn't the Rehnquist court. You know, the, the Federalism Revolution, when people say it began and ended with Rehnquist and O'Connor, my strong sense is that Alito and Roberts believe a lot of things passionately about affirmative action and voting rights and gay marriage. I don't think I ever really believed this was their issue. Um, and so I, and I think I even wrote, they're going to save their powder for next year for the issues that they lie awake sweating. And uh, I just didn't think states' rights was one of them. I, I think Roberts would have very happily joined the dissenters if the stakes weren't what they were. Uh, so I don't want to minimize where he was. But I, I think he is going to come back in October and be the John Roberts that we all expect him to be. And this is going to be a very, very, very uh, volatile year. You don't buy necessarily the argument that many commentators had that somehow he thought through this was an opportunity to elevate the court, the standing of the court, um, that sort of stature type thing. I'm sure of that. I'm sure that the one thing he was was Rehnquist's clerk. Yeah. And this was, you know, this was, was Rehnquist in the Miranda case, and this is Roberts today. You know, I hate this, but I'm going to hold my nose and do it because it's the difference between being chief. Uh, so I do believe that. I think that was a big piece of it. Um, I think that he, the other thing that is so important is that he's young. And that if you look at Scalia and Kennedy, you know, 75, 
why am I not seeing my life's dreams realized? Very frustrated. Roberts is playing the long game. Roberts didn't have to get this done today. And he certainly laid out markers for how he's going to get it done in the future. So I think you're quite right. There's a combination of, I think this wasn't exactly his fight. Uh, I think his age made it much more expedient to wait and do this right. in increments. And I think that he has a very lofty, God bless him, role of the court as an apolitical institution and that he knew, especially after Citizens United, what a 5-4 decision would have done.